Go ahead, please. When it comes to comparisons between wheelchair tennis and the pedestrian form of the sport, there are really only two major differences. The first, the two-bounce rule, we've talked about before. The second, and perhaps less understood difference, is the classification system. Designed to maintain integrity of competition and ensure a level playing field, as far as possible anyway, wheelchair tennis, like all para sports, has an international classification system in place. And it's important that the right system is created, so competition is determined by sporting ability rather than a player's degree of impairment. Up until May 2019, the eligibility criteria to compete on the Tour and at the Paralympics was simply based on whether it was possible for you to play the pedestrian game. If you couldn't, and your impairment affected your lower limbs only, then you were eligible to play in the open division of wheelchair tennis. If one or both upper limbs were affected as well, players could opt to go through a further process and get classified in the quad division. It was a system established by the ITF and recognised by the International Paralympic Committee that took into account the sport and how it is played. For example, having the power or function to perform the shots only scratches the surface of what makes a great tennis player. There's also the cerebral element of having a sharp tennis brain, meaning even a player who looks weaker on paper can overcome an opponent considered more physically powerful with the right tactics and game plan. Of course, no classification system can ever be perfect, and over the years there have been debates over power chairs versus manual on the same court, and where the boundaries should be drawn between an open division player and a quad player. But on the whole, it was seen as a fair system that was inclusive and helped to grow the sport at all levels. But after the Sydney Paralympics in 2000, when the Spanish basketball team were found to have fielded a team of mostly non-disabled athletes in order to win gold in the intellectual disability event, the IPC set about developing a new set of codes to ensure intentional misrepresentation, a form of cheating in Paralympic sport, couldn't occur again on that scale. Sports wishing to remain part of the Paralympic movement would, over time, have to reform their classification to fall in line with the IPC's international standard of eligible impairments. The last two don't really apply to wheelchair tennis, as there are separate visually impaired and learning disability forms of the game anyway. But it also details those not eligible to compete. This includes health conditions that primarily cause pain, fatigue or hypermobility, such as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and complex regional pain syndrome. This means athletes who were previously competing and forging careers in the sport with those impairments would now be defined as non-eligible to compete. After a transition period, which expires at the end of 2021, these players will then fall through the gaps, unable to compete in the pedestrian game because of their disability, but also unable to compete in the para version because they don't meet the minimum eligibility criteria for impairment, effectively deemed not disabled enough for the Paralympics. And given the games are so important in the wheelchair tennis calendar because of its prestige and the spotlight it shines on the sport, the ITF were bound to adopt the new guidelines. There will remain only two divisions in the elite international game, open and quad, with no parallel circuit to capture those who don't fit into the predefined IPC categories. These players simply won't have a way of competing internationally. Instead, they will find a newly installed glass ceiling of competing on the lower profile, lower paid domestic competitions, which remain in the hands of national governing bodies. So is this fair? Well, the changes bring wheelchair tennis in line with the other sports you'll see at the rescheduled Tokyo Games, and sports like archery and swimming have had to make amendments to their classification processes too. And as stated earlier, classification isn't, and probably never will be, perfect. On one side of the net, you've got to consider how to create a level playing field for those who fit into the eligibility criteria as it exists now. The transitional period, introduced to ensure those declassified could still compete in Tokyo, having already laid the training groundwork for it, has created a potential issue. Some argue having declassified athletes on the tour, competing for titles, points, money and medals against still eligible athletes isn't necessarily fair. On the other side of the net are the implications for the declassified athletes, some of whom already have established careers and are now having to look at retirement and alternative career plans far earlier than they expected. 
There are also question marks over whether there's enough support in place to help with the mental health implications of this and how these athletes are now being viewed by opponents and the media. And while currently you may only hear about a handful of players being affected, those with a longer-term view fear a trickle-down effect impacting the growth and development of the sport from grassroots level up. At a time when there's a drive to encourage more disabled people to be active by increasing inclusive opportunities, it's difficult to see how this new system can be seen as fulfilling that inclusive agenda. So, where do we go from here? Well, if nothing changes, it will be game set and career over for those declassified athletes come the end of the 2021 season, or earlier for those who see the writing on the wall. Other para sports do have a division for newly non-eligible athletes, but how competitive this would be and how long it would take to build up a sizable circuit of players is open to question. Might we see the emergence of a privately funded tour separate to the existing one that isn't governed by the classification system and allows participation for all? Or do the Paralympics and the Olympics need to work more closely together to find a solution that allows those who fall between the gaps to compete at the highest level? At the minute, there are no clear-cut answers, and potentially the only way to find them is to continue to keep the debate open. So whatever happens in the future, the sport of wheelchair tennis keeps its reputation as one of the most inclusive around.